shall we seek our Heavenly Father's wisdom as we begin this study? And offer a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, as we begin this study, we see and we understand our great need of you at this time of our history. Please direct us, Father. Please guide us. Show us that that you would have us to understand so that we may be prepared for that which is coming upon this earth. Help us, Father, so that our minds may be receptive for that which you would teach us. Guide us so that that which we learn, we may be able to teach others. Help us so that we may be able to stand firm in the events in these coming days. Direct us now, be with us. For this we thank you. For this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> but what we were talking about in the outset was we're going to get into just a couple of verses in Malachi 4. And it's, it's kind of interesting because Malachi 4 is the shortest of the chapters of the book of Malachi. Now, when we read this, Malachi 4.1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, how would we normally take this verse? How would we normally look at this in relation to what we've been studying? Well, normally this is just the destruction of the wicked. Okay. So, but if we're, you're going to use this symbolically. Right. Uh, the day that cometh to burn as an oven. So this would. Um, well, this could refer to the Sunday law. Well, it's kind of interesting to me because as, I, as I've been going through this to prepare for the study, mm -hmm. 31 different documents Mrs. White used just on this one verse. Really? And wow. some of the things that, that she combined with this verse, you may find a little surprising. Okay. So I'm going to switch to the other screen right now. Can you see that where it shows 1881 at the top? Yeah, yeah that's, that's what we were looking at. Yep. Okay. So hang on with me for a second. My dog has a, a habit of wanting to come in and out every time I'm doing a study. So. <laughs> As she wrote in 1881 in Testimony 30, Christ is our example. We must keep the pattern continually before us and contemplate the infinite sacrifice which has been made to redeem us from the thraldom of sin. As we look into the mirror, we find ourselves condemned. Let us not venture farther in transgression, but face right about and wash our robes of character in the blood of the Lamb, that they may be spotless, let us cry as did David, open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Those whom God has entrusted time and means, that they may be a blessing unto hum humanity, but who have squandered these gifts needlessly upon themselves and their children will have a fearful account to meet at the bar of God. Here again, she refers back to the verse that we just read. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. The unbelieving world will soon have something to think of beside their dress and their appearance. And as their minds are torn from these things by distress and perplexity, 
they have nothing to turn to. They are not prisoners of hope and therefore do not turn to the stronghold. Their hearts will fail them with repining and fear. They have not made God their refuge and he will not be their consolation. He will laugh at their calamity and mock when their fear cometh. Now, with all of this that we've been facing for these last what? Almost 18 months. We're hearing, oh, well, this is so deadly. This is, this is such, you know, such a calamity. We must do this. We must do that. <clears throat> Yet what is she saying here? Those that make God their refuge and that make him their consolation are not to worry about this. Amen. Those among Sabbath keepers who have yielded to the influence of the world are to be tested. The perils of the last days are upon us, and a trial is before the professed people of God, which many have not anticipated. The genuineness of their faith will be proved. Many have united with worldlings in pride, in vanity, and pleasure seeking, flattering themselves that they could do this and still be Christians. How many have we seen like this? I remember having dinner with a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and his wife, where he recounted how he'd been to dinner with another friend of his, and he just had to try a specific French dish. And I just let him go on with his story. Because his choicest fresh French dish was escargot or snails. Uh -huh. I have been to dinner with other Adventists that support their church as well. But they believe, hey, the law of Moses has nothing for us so. We can be free to eat of crab. We can be free to eat of shrimp, of lobster. These are all things that God created. Oh. All of these things were things that I learned about when I first came into the church years ago. How much faith do we have in the law of God? The genuineness of their faith will be proved. Many have united with worldlings in pride, in vanity, and in pleasure seeking, flattering themselves that they could do this and still be Christians. But it is such indulgences that separate them from God and make them children of the world. Christ has given us no such example. Those only who deny self and live a life of sobriety, humility, and holiness, are, is that not three steps? Mm -hmm. Are true followers of Christ. And such cannot enjoy the society of the lovers of the world. We've spoken many times that the gospel is a three-step prophetic testing message. Mm. When I read this, Sobriety, humility, and holiness. There's your three points. There you go. And actually, the, there is a logic in a progression of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you first need to be sober in order to come to God, to study God's word. And then that leads to humility, and humility leads to holiness. Right. Agreed. So all of this is something that as we study, we will find 
how this progression is presented to us multiple times in scripture and over and over and over again within the spirit of prophecy. Now, one thing here, just dealing with how she's addressing this verse. Sure. She seems to be applying it pretty much similar to the idea as the refiner and purifier of silver. Yes. That is, it's not about the destruction of the wicked in the way that she's applying it as much as about the destruction of the world and whether we're attached to it or not. That if we're attached to it, we will be destroyed. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Now, in Signs of the Times, 27 of November of 1884, she wrote the following. Said Christ, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. God did not condemn the antediluvians for eating and drinking. He had given them the fruits of the earth in great abundance to supply their physical wants. Their sin consisted in taking these gifts without gratitude to the giver and debasing themselves by indulging appetite without restraint. Mm -hmm. It was lawful for them to marry. Marriage Marriage was and is in God's order. It was one of the first institutions that he established. He gave special directions concerning this ordinance, clothing it with sanctity and beauty. But these directions were forgotten and marriage was perverted and made to minister to passion. The pious mingled with the depraved and became like them in spirit and in deeds. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Yeah. That's what Ellen White calls amalgamation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. A similar state of things exists in the past in relation to marriage. Is that what she says? No, now. So if she is writing more for our time than for her time, this is what exists now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we can obviously see that. Well, of course. Yeah. But this is, this is part of our conversation, right? Yeah. Marriages are formed between the godly and the ungodly because inclination governs in the selection of husband or wife. The parties do not ask counsel of God, nor give his glory in, or have his glory in view. Christianity ought to have a controlling, sanctifying influence upon the marriage relation, but husband and wife are not united by Christian principle. Uncontrolled passion lies at the foundation of many of the marriages that are contracted at the present time. Now, that's also if you take this in a sort of a symbolic sense. I mean, we see this spiritually as well. Right. You know, with the mixture of Protestant and Adventist theology. And that. That's been the point of all of the studies that we've been doing these last several Sunday afternoons, right? Mm -hmm. And then also coming to the, the net effect from the book of Ezra when Judah and Benjamin were to come before the temple in the cold rain, right? Mm -hmm. So all of this has a symbolic representation for our time and we have to consider exactly what we're seeing now this next paragraph there is a, a big reason that i i placed the bold where i did mm -hmm. in noah's day there were men who laughed 
to scorn his words of warning. Since July 19th, in our day, there have been men who have laughed to scorn at the words of warning regarding Nashville. Mm -hmm. Since December 6th, there have been many within the movement that have been highly critical, very scornful about any kind of study that involves chronology. Now I'm, I'm going to read this next portion, but I'm also going to reread it in a secondary way. They said that there were fixed laws in nature, which made a flood impossible, that Noah was crazy on this subject. And if there were any truth in what he said, the men of renown, the wise, the prudent, the great men would understand the matter. <laughs> now, I look at this and I see four, the men of renown, the wise, the prudent, and the great. Does this not also apply like the four generations would apply? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now to reread, they said that Mrs. White has stated that time is no longer in reference to scripture, which makes the setting of dates impossible. That those that are studying to chronologically understand what is happening are crazy. And if there was any truth, God would say it. Those more learned within the movement would say it. Those more learned within the church, these would understand the matter. What there was Mrs. White said in, that there was uh, the stars that are going to be falling, that the, the people that had the most spirituality were the, like the last to come into it. I mean, so that, that all doesn't, that makes sense to me what you're saying here on this. Uh -huh. there, there's uh -huh. so, so many things that we've been seeing since, really since December 6th of last year that it just... It's incredible. There was yeah. total disbelief in Noah's testimony in regard to the coming judgments. But this unbelief did not prevent or hinder the coming storm. Did this unbelief of Jonah prevent God from his forbearance with Nineveh? <laughs> Not one bit. Did this total belief of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah prevent the outpouring of fire and brimstone that came upon those cities? Their ashes speak the truth. Okay. Did this total disbelief of Annas and Caiaphas, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem that hung Christ upon the cross, did it stop his resurrection? And will it stop the coming judgments? At the appointed time, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And the windows of heaven were opened, and the earth was washed of its corruption. Only those who found shelter in the ark were saved. Is our time any different from Noah's time? 
No. Reader, another storm is coming. The earth will again be swept by the dev desolating wrath of God. And again, sin and sinners will be destroyed. Do you feel that it is an event of little importance? Read some of the utterances of the prophets in reference to the day of God. Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. From Joel, alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near and hastens greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Zephaniah 1, 14 and 15. What day are we living in right now? Given the way that the governments of the world have been approaching things. Would they not see this as a day of darkness? Would they not see this as a gloomy day? But though this is a day of trouble and distress to the wicked, the righteous will be able to say, lo, this is our God. Where is our faith? In whom do we have faith? How many of us today would great, graciously and gratefully seek counsel from Dr. Bill Gates for our health needs? For does he not have an amazing medical degree? Well, he doesn't really have any degree. Right. So should we be looking to him or should we be looking to our God? But, but even, even if he had a degree, it wouldn't really matter. I'd still look to God. Agreed. <clears throat> That's, it, it's one of the points that I have used in speaking with those that are within the church, those that are not within the church. Solomon made it very clear and, and, and was extremely direct in the book of Proverbs, how we are to look at this. I mean, is there anything new under the sun? No. If there is nothing new under the sun, then God has seen it all. And if he's seen it all, what do we have to fear? Amen. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation the truth will be their shield and their buckler now i know what a shield is how many of you know what a buckler is it's a type of sword i disagree with you sister okay right what is it a shield is something that you would you would have to protect yourself up here. I think if you look up a buckler, you will find that it's a covering for your knuckles. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. At least that's what I what I came to understanding from doing some studies in Elizabethan English. Yeah, I know that's how you hold your sword. Uh, 
Yeah, so it's a kind of shield, a piece of defensive armor anciently used in war. It was composed of wood or wick wickers woven together, covered with skin or leather, fortified with plates of brass or other metal, and worn on the left arm. On the middle was an umbo boss or prominence, very useful in casting stones and darts to glance off. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I always understood that it was part of the use of the shield. Okay. So it's I a just, defensive weapon. Defensive. It's a defense, something to defend you. Right. Yourself. It's it, but it's not, a, it's not a sword. Yeah, it's not a sword. Interesting. Okay. That's what you use to deflect the swords. Yeah. Uh -huh. God will be their refuge, and under his wings shall they trust, says the psalmist. Because thou hast made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now, when I read that, that portion, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Mm -hmm. Do we not find this in Leviticus 25? Mm -hmm. Is this just not another extension of the blessings? If we are willing to accept that God is leading. Now you can find this portion of Signs of the Times also repeated three years later in Bible Echo, 1st of July, 1887. Mrs. White continues. Now, HS, historical sketches. These are actually sermons that she gave while she was in Europe. Wonderful events are soon to open before the world. The end of some things are at hand. All things. Of course. The end of all things is at hand. And this is what we need to believe. We need to understand that God is just as tired of sin as we are. As I've, as I've referred before, I remember sitting and speaking with the wife of, that was married to one of the leaders in the last of the corporate Adventist churches that I regularly attended. And her comment to me was, I don't know if Christ is going to return in a hundred years or in a thousand years. It could be tomorrow, but I'm not betting on it. I think it's going to be much longer. And all, all I could do was sit there slack jawed because I could not understand how someone could become a leader in a church and wish to believe that. The time of trouble is about to come upon the people of God. Then it is that the decree will go forth forbidding those who keep the Sabbath of the Lord to buy or sell, and threatening them with punishment and even death if they do not observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath. Mrs. White combines that thought with this. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Daniel 12.1. Now we know that when Michael stands up, probation is closed for everyone. Correct? Uh -huh. But we know that there is going to be 
times of trouble before them. By this, we see the importance of having our names written in the book of life. All whose names are registered there will be delivered from Satan's power, and Christ will command that their filthy garments be removed and that they be clothed with his righteousness. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Malachi 3.17. In the time of trouble, Satan stirs up the wicked, and they encircle the people of God to destroy them. But he does not know that pardon has been written opposite their names in the books of heaven. He does not know that the command has been given, take away the filthy garments from them, clothe them with change of raiment, and set a fair mitre upon their heads. And for this, we need to see Zechariah 3, 4, and 5. I'm finding it interesting the way that she's combining all of these. I don't see that this is a, a true progression, but I see that she's giving us elements that we need to consider. Any well, thoughts? Well, the one thing I would think here that, you know, we take some of these events that are future, right? That deal with the end times, and but yet she's applying them ahead of time to our time in a way that we would call uh, typical of what's going to happen. Okay, agreed. Right, so when she talks, for instance, about you know, Malachi chapter four, they will burn them up, leaving neither root nor branch. Now we know that is about the destruction of the wicked at the end of the world, but it also occurs typically before that. Okay. That it's Agreed. The, refi the refiner's fire is doing this work. The world is being burnt up prior to that time. And, and it can be true, even verse 2, where it says, um, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as the calves of the stall. Well, we often apply that to after everything's over, you know, we're short, we're going to grow up and be taller in the new earth. But we can see that this healing has to happen before then. All of this work has to happen prior to then, right. prior to the close of probation, in a, in a spiritual sense. I wouldn't disagree. Any other thoughts? The promise made to Joshua is made to all of the remnant people of God. If thou wilt walk in my ways, not in your ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shalt also keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Zechariah 3, 7. Now, we've been addressing this from Malachi, especially Malachi 2, about the injunction that's been given to the priests. And we've been applying this in a very symbolic way that the priests represent the movement. Could we also apply this with the vision of Ezekiel 9? What do you think? Well, in what way with the vision of Ezekiel 9? What, what are you trying to say there? Because you got the writer. Um, 
well, this is is the the six men that come right one with the writer's ink horn, and um, and this is going to be the Sunday law. But this is the sealing of of God. This is the you know the the seal of God, right? A mark setting a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. Um, and then you have the destruction of those um, that don't have that mark. So which, which part are you referring to? Well, if, if we're walking in, if we're walking in his ways and not in our own ways, are we not accepting the admonitions and the promises of Leviticus 25? Mm -hmm. so then in if you will keep my charge then thou shalt also judge my house the examples that are being shown in ezekiel okay, 9 is that also not judging the house of god beginning at the ancients mm -hmm. yeah and after let's go ahead well, in verse six, yeah, they begin at the ancient men, which were before the house. Okay. And if they have begun at the ancient men, then they're going to go from the ancient men to keep his courts. And would they not have places to walk among these that stand by? Is this not giving reference to the fact that those that would like joshua walk in god's ways would be preparing others to help to walk and teach these things now she continues and says it this way who are these that stand by they are the angels of God, the messengers of God. Could our eyes be opened, as were those of the servant of Elisha at Dothan, we would see evil angels all around us, urging, our, urging their presence upon us, and watching for an opportunity to tempt and overthrow us. We should also see holy angels guarding us, and with their light and their power, pressing back the evil angels. How can we give a message if we're not relying upon God? What would that message be then if you weren't relying upon God? I think it would be just different enough that it would not have the, the power and the truth and the grace I mean, how many times? Sure. Absolutely. How, how many times within the church in the last 30, 40 years have we seen a message that tells us of this three step prophetic trip? three-step prophetic testing message and reveals it carefully and completely. Now, Ellen White says that every time we present a sermon, that it's supposed to bring conviction. Right. But we rarely ever hear a convicting sermon. Right. Sermons are not meant to convict. They're meant to entertain, to flatter. Soothe. Yeah. I, I have not heard many convicting sermons from any Seventh-day Adventist pastors since 1968. Yeah, definitely not often from pastors, though we do get them in Warburg from our present pastor, and we've always got them from the, the lay people in the church. Okay. 
I mean, we have had some people who just kind of do story sermons, but it doesn't happen often in Warburg. It's mostly going to be something that's meant to bring conviction. But that's not common. Not common at all. No. If we could only see the many dangers from which we are daily preserved by the holy angels, instead of complaining of our trials and misfortunes, we would talk continually of the mercies of God. This last week, I had to spend some time and spend some money because the service rigs that I have were both down. It's real difficult to drive in this kind of weather, snow and ice, when you have no heat in a vehicle. So I had rented, I'd rented a truck to get the work taken care of. Now, I made a run down, down to Oregon, took care of the business that I had to have done there, noted that there were issues because the vehicle was having problems and saying it was in, in dire need of service. I contacted the company I'd rented from and I just said very nicely, I said, it's a nice vehicle, but it's in need of service and some of the features on this vehicle are being shut down because it needs service. I really don't want to be driving a vehicle that says charging system needs service and be hundreds of miles away and all of a sudden have a problem. I don't want to ruin your vehicle. They agreed. They put me in another vehicle. Well, the other vehicle also had service warnings on it. These were a little different because a lot of the newer import vehicles have tire pressure sensors. And the unfortunate thing was, is that this was was giving a, a warning that one of the rear tires was substantially low on, on air. If you've never had to drive on an icy highway and drive in severe winter conditions, a tire that's just almost flat is real difficult to, to navigate on, a, on, on those kind of roads. Mm -hmm. Now, as I drove this last week, I just left it in God's hands. I said, look, you know, if I'm not supposed to be here, you will show me. If this is where I am to go, thank you. And I ask for your, your guidance and your protection. As I drove on this road, I found that these vehicles can be very difficult when you go to disengage, let's say your um, cruise control, because the flatter the tire, the easier it is to go into a spin. <laughs> and I almost went into a spin on a two lane road with passing one party and had other parties coming at me. I thank God that I didn't go into a spin, but I learned quite a bit. We should not be complaining about our trials. As we've talked in the past, when we're dealing with the refiner and purifier of silver, he waits until he sees his reflection perfectly reflected in that product so that all of the dross is consumed. Many, many times I have been guilty of the fact that I don't like this trial. I'd rather be out of this trial, but it is for my own good. God protects us from many dangers on a daily basis. And it's because of his angels 
that we are being protected in that way. We shouldn't be complaining. Are we not told in scripture to praise him in all things? Yes. So we should talk continually of the mercies of God. How precious in the sight of God are his people. If Satan had his way, Whenever an effort is made to bring souls into the truth, both minister and those who come to hear would be made to suffer in body and in mind. But angels of God are commissioned to accompany his servants and to protect them and their hearers. Satan pleads for the privilege of separating these angels from them, that he may compass their destruction. But Jesus forbids it. If it were not for the constant guardianship of these angels, we would not be able to live on earth and present the truth. That is a very blunt statement for us. It's just as blunt as ones where I have read the Mrs. White makes it very, very clear that those that enter the theater are placing themselves on ground where their angels will not accompany them. Mm. Theater, we mean entertainment type stuff, right? Uh, uh, if she was he, defining it today, you would say TV. She was saying it today. There could be TV. There could be any type of um, cinema. Yes. That kind of stuff. Right. Entertainment for our purposes, like football and all the rest of those things. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that is kind of a blunt object. There have been times since the third angel's message was first proclaimed when angels in the form of human beings have appeared to men and conversed with them as they did with Abraham of old. So could we say that the three angels message, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come was given to Abraham. I believe we can show it all the way back at the very beginning in Genesis. I agree. When the complaints of Satan are entered against the servants of God, angels are often sent down to investigate their course. Sometimes conversing with men unbeknown to them they sometimes question those in error until they tell all that is in their hearts. And then these angels bear their report back to heaven, relating things just as they exist. Is this not a fearful, a fearful statement for us? Yes. If we, if we continue to complain about the state of things, repining, moaning about how hard things are, then is this the report that's going to be born about us? It's kind of been my impression that uh, the more people complain, the more complaints happen. Sure. And I'm talking about in like a succession type of thing. Like when I start complaining then somebody else starts complaining then somebody else starts complaining. But a lot of times if I just don't say anything as a complaint issue, there, I never hear anything else. But if I say it once, it starts reverberating through others. Yeah. Complaint. I agree. Jacob, in his vision of the ladder, whose base rested upon the earth, 
and whose topmost round reached to the highest heaven, saw that God of heaven, standing above the ladder of glorious brightness, and angels of God constantly ascending and descending upon it. This fitly represents the love and the care of God for his children, and the constant communication there is between heaven and earth. It is also intended to impress us with the importance of walking circumspectly before God. Oh, that I could say something to impress you with the offensive character of sin in God's sight. So here we have been comparing Jacob, Abraham, the third angel's message. And then with these supposed minor prophets of Malachi, Zechariah, and we'll get into Zephaniah here soon, along with that of Daniel. Mrs. White has been very clear. We need to be looking at these, quote, minor prophets and studying them in conjunction with the book of Daniel. How much more will we find when we accept what she has said and follow her counsel? Should we not be able to reason from cause to effect of what these passages are saying to us for us today? There are many today who profess to serve God, but who are not doing so in reality. But when Christ comes, it will be known who are the chosen of God. Then ye shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. The exhortation of the prophet is, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord has come upon you. Zephaniah 2 verse 1. Seek the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah 2 verse 3. Here she is repeating for us and placing this admonition of Zephaniah directly before us. In the view of what is soon to come upon the earth, I entreat you, brethren and sisters, to walk before God in all meekness and lowliness of mind, remembering the care that Jesus has for you. All the meek of the earth are exhorted to seek him. Those who have wrought his judgments are to seek him. Let self break in pieces before God. It is hard to do this, but we are warned to fall upon the rock and be broken, else it will fall upon us and grind us to powder. It is to the humble in heart that Jesus speaks. His everlasting arms encircle them, and he will not leave them to perish by the hands of the wicked. Is this not a promise that we should be able to hold on to? Is this not the type of admonition that we should accept for and hold with our very lives? Yes. All heaven is interested in the salvation of the human race. 
What are you doing for yourselves, brethren? While from the light of the cross of Calvary, you obtain a view of the great love of God for man, do not build yourself up in self-esteem, but in humility of soul, stand before God as prisoners of hope. Why not be in earnest in your efforts for eternal life? Why not manifest a perseverance and an intensity of desire proportionate to the value of the object of which you are in pursuit? Instead of doing this, many now engage in the work of God at will and let it alone at pleasure. They thus invite Satan to come in and take possession of their hearts. Any comment or any thought? What is it to be a Christian? It is to be Christ-like. It is to do the works of Christ. Some fail on one point, some on another. Some are natural, naturally impatient. Satan understands their weaknesses and manages to overcome them again and again. But let none be discouraged by this. Whenever little annoyances and trials arise, ask God in silent prayer to give you strength and grace to bear them patiently. Mm -hmm. There is a power in silence. Do not speak a word until you have sent up your petition to the God of heaven. If you will always do this, you will soon overcome your hasty temper and you will have a little heaven here to go to heaven in. Yeah. What this reminds me of a little bit is, um, well, uh, Toby's sermon yesterday. Yes. Um, I was hoping he had done a more hard-hitting sermon. He's he's very gentle. Now, it you know, in what he was presenting, there was definitely nothing wrong about it. And I understand what he was trying to do. He was trying to get us to look at our own sins and not the sins of others. Hard to but, do. It's well, it's hard to do because it's not our nature. Our nature is right. to ourselves with others. And and I thought he should have made the point more forcefully, though I did miss part of it. So maybe he did later on, but we have to go for a walk. Um, but it but it's a difficult thing. I mean, to tell someone they should be looking at themselves instead of someone else. Well, they're saying, well, why don't you look at yourself? <laughs> yep. Right? Because we can all look at each other and see defects. I mean, I can think of times when I've spoken and it's not been accepted very well. And a lot of blame was put on me for the things I said. Yet, I don't ever believe I entered into any of those situations rashly. That is, I entered into them with prayer and people didn't want to hear what I had to say. But I still approached it in you know that i was at fault now sometimes i'm not sure if i should do that but um when it comes to the issues that are facing this movement right now i mean we are supposed to have an upper room experience and we need to be able to see that we're not all right because that's what the church has always done. When you talk about sermons, you know, you have these sermons, these smooth sermons that that sort of put you to sleep. They make you feel that you're okay. They don't bring any conviction. I've been to that sermon a couple, three times. Yeah. But, you know, and, and I think, you know, I understand what Toby was trying to do, but I don't know if people picked up on what he was trying to do. Because what he did a much stronger sermon a week before December 6th. 
well, eight days before December 6th, the week before that weekend. And I was hoping that he would do that same type of presentation. I mean, we do need to be Christians in the home. We do need to reflect Christ's character in all that we do. But we need to be told that we're far from that. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, it, doesn't she say to admonish one another or to, to, to um, encourage to do right all the time to mm -hmm. others? Um, those types of things. It's, it's, it sounds to me, because I've never heard her draw back from calling sin, sin. Mm -hmm. um, I have that problem, not necessarily uh, to call sin, sin, but I, I, every time I see somebody else sinning, um, I, I, I think about all the sins that I've done, you know, here, why would I continue looking at his sins? I should be looking at my own sins, mm -hmm. you know, not just should be, I, I, I turn back and in, inside onto myself. When I see somebody else sinning, I say, yep, that's me doing the same things, doing stupid stuff. I just don't know how to get a shift out of that though. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've been listening to all of the, the stuff that we've been going through. And the best thing that I can think of is just uh, continually, like she just said just a minute ago, is, is lift up your prayers before you open your fat mouth. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to say fat. But... <laughs> I mean, I have the tendency of sticking my foot all the way down my throat, you know, not just in my mouth. <laughs> and it's just by opening it. So is that, should I keep, should I just stay silent? <laughs> Can't do that now, can you? Well, this is the difficulty. The difficulty is how do you admonish others when you see yourself in the condition that you're in? I'm dealing with that right now with a friend. Um, or not Well, he's a friend now, and I kind of got him the job that he had. I, I made him aware of it, and I'm training him now. And uh, come to find out, he's a minister or former minister. And now he doesn't believe the Bible because he thinks that, uh, um, you know, uh, who are they? <laughs> the other, you know, the guys that are uh, part of the Jesuit order, but not the Jesuit order. They've changed all the words in the books is, is his thought and. And I'm like, you're a minute, you were, a, I'm thinking to myself, you were a minister. Um, don't. Well, well, it would have been his training that did that too. Yeah. Um, yes, I get that. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to um, communicate it with him without, you know, bashing him or anything. I just, I just so feel so helpless with, I mean, I believe in the, the word that's, I mean, if, if God is the creator and he, he has, he's the ultimate power. Wouldn't he have the power to preserve as well as to destroy? Uh, so wouldn't he be able to keep his, his words intact pretty much? Yeah, well, fairly? definitely God has preserved his word. The question here, though, that we're running into in this movement, because we're, we're in a sense running out of time, we are. is that God wants to purify this movement. <laughs> This movement, this line, whatever it is that we're in, has a purpose. It has an end point. And that end point is basically six days away. And we're talking about the 25th date, right? Yeah, December 25th. So we come to the end of that. And we should be in harmony. We should be in unity. But what we have is we have all different kinds of views people pushing different agendas, people who are not really accepting July 18th, even though they say they do, because they're not interested in anything connected with it. We have different presentations or views on righteousness by faith. Um, some I would call self-righteousness by faith. Mm. That is, they focus upon righteousness, but righteousness is the type of righteousness that we can see. So, the little things that we can do that make us think that we're righteous, paying tithe, 
um, you know, fasting twice in the week, all these things that the Pharisees did, whatever they are for us today, whether it's following the health message strictly or dress reform, and we can think this makes us righteous. But the day is going to come when all of those things are going to be destroyed. Right? God will leave them neither root nor branch. And so the question that we have, you know, right now is what do we do? I mean, you know, I have, you know, how can I say anything to anyone else when other people can see that I have defects in character and I have people who, who basically totally discount anything that I say, Mm -hmm. how can I, how can I say to that person, you know, we need to get together and they'll say, well, you're the problem. I've had people tell me that I'm the problem Mm -hmm. in the movement. You know, I'm the one who's causing division. Well, in that situation, how do I do anything about it? So the question is, Dwight, so when we we look at this this statement here where are you going to place this how are you going to apply this to this movement at the present time is it just that some in this movement are going to be destroyed and we just have to cling to christ that there's nothing we can do to help anyone else i think the the best way of putting it is that we have to lead by example But when we look at ourselves, we don't see ourselves as great examples. <laughs> That's me. I don't see myself as a good example. Okay. Uh, I'll give you a personal witness. Yeah. In the years that I've had staffs, I've had multiple different people that have worked for me. Some people were, were excellent salespeople. Some were not. Mm-hmm. I've had some people that were good technicians and some were not. Most of the time I've had to train as I've gone. Mm. And one man that came to me that had been a union electrician. He'd been my neighbor. He was no longer working for the union because he found out on a job where he was the overall ramrod on the job. Doing a a Safeway grocery store that they were going to come through and do a, a urinalysis. And because of his choice to use marijuana, if he was tested and found to have used it, then he would have been taken off the job and would not have been able to be sent back to the jobs. Now, he kept telling me that he was freed from this and he was was just not dealing with it. He just didn't want to go back to the union jobs. Well, we Mm. had a... We had a situation in the office where I knew that he was having to make sure that his kids got to school, but I needed him at the office at eight o'clock so that I could schedule him out to different jobs that had to be done. He didn't like that. He wanted to come when he wanted to come in so that he could leave when he wanted to leave. And that didn't always work for me. We had a situation, we're standing in the office one day, and he is angry, and he's shouting at me. Now, another employee was was there watching what was going on. As I'm being shouted at, and as this man was literally inches away from my nose, I'm praying, and I'm saying, Father, let me be an example of what Christ would do in this situation. Let me show your grace and not mine, because this is not the situation that I really want to be in. But he continued shouting at me and literally was spitting in my face. The other employee came up to me after this 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 session was done and he said i am so surprised that you didn't just haul off and belt him now this is something that i've had to ask 
every time that little annoyances and little and trials have arisen, that God gives me the strength to bear them. It's something that I've had to learn to practice. Yeah. On a daily basis. Moment by moment for me. For me as well. And here again, I find there is a power in silence. Do not speak a word until you have sent up your petition to the God of heaven. Yes. When I was last in Arkansas, when I was picked up at the airport and I was told that the purpose of these meetings was to restrict people from using FFA's forum for their participation and for their viewpoints. I spent time praying then as well. I didn't say much at all. And when I did say things, I was being told by certain people that I was totally wrong. I would go back to the scripture. I would go back and I would dig deeper and find that I might have expressed myself poorly, but what I was saying was not wrong. Now, the promise that's given here, if you will always do this, you will soon overcome your hasty temper. It sounds like a promise to me. So we have to decide, are we accepting this written for us today? Or was this just written for the people back in 1886? No question in my mind. Repeat, please. So there's no question in my mind. Okay. There's none in mine either. I know it's for me. Now, this portion, this, this sermon that she gave is also repeated for us in Signs of the Times, 2nd of June, 1890. Now, when we find things that are being repeated, As, we, as we've stated before, when we see, say the words, hold, hold, are we not seeing a reference to the second angel's message? So if she is giving this sermon in Europe and then publishing it in America, is this not an admonition for us to consider more carefully the second angel's message? Okay, manuscript 29 of 1895. Now I know that we've, we've got about 12 minutes remaining, but there's some points here that she has made that tie this to many of the things that we've been addressing. The last dream which God gave to Nebuchadnezzar and the experience of the king in connection with it have lessons of vital importance to all who are connected with the work of God. The king was troubled by his dream. It was evidently a prediction of adversity, and none of his wise men would attempt to interpret it. The servant of God was summoned. The faithful Daniel stood before the king not to flatter, not to misinterpret in order to secure favor. A solemn duty rested upon him to tell the king of Babylon the truth. He said, My Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all under which the beasts of the field dwell 
and upon those whose branches the fowls of the heaven had habitation, is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven, and thy dominion unto the ends of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with the band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king that they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the most high ruleth the kingdom of men and giveth it to whom he will. Here the, the phrase seven times is used twice. The application that Father Miller had made was that this was giving additional understanding to Leviticus 25 and 26. Yet, according to many today, this is not the case. Now, this admonition to Nebuchadnezzar is recorded as having transpired literally. What application can we make of this today figuratively? So are you going to take the time? No, I'm, I'm saying the band of iron and the brass, the grass of the field, the dew of heaven, and the beasts. Well, symbolically, beasts are nations, peoples, right? Okay. Uh, brass and iron is, to me, is still uh, Rome and Greece or the combination thereof. Are they not medals of judgment? Yes. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, is Nebuchadnezzar at this point representing a nation or is he representing a church? Uh, I would think he was representing our church at this point. So if he's representing a church and he's been given this warning of the seven times and has rejected the warning of the seven times, to what church should this be applied? Adventist. Okay. I'm sorry, Seventh Day Adventist. Thank you. So if this is applied to the Seventh-day Adventist church, just as we were applying Malachi 2, then we are in a situation because in Malachi 2, the priests had forsaken the wife of their youth. Right. The application that was being made here was that the wife of their youth is symbolized by the two charts that are behind me. And the method of study and understanding that was given to us by Father Miller. That's all reasonable. So... <clears throat> 
if Nebuchadnezzar was driven from men and the dwelling will be with the beasts of the field, does that not also mean that the portion that they, they inherit will be just as the other nations of the world? That is where it sounds to me. Are we not told at the end that many of pleasing address will reject the final message, but that there will be some that will join with this final message at the end? Yes. Would they not be represented by the stump of the roots? Uh. I'm sorry, rephrase that or ask that again. And when you say that, would those, stump, who's those, yeah. uh, who are those? That would those that join at the end? With us? Yes. Or with the movement? I'm sorry, yes. with the movement. Would those not be represented by the stump of the roots? Yes, it sounds like it. Okay. Symbolically, yes. Symbolically. Because the stump is is the the <laughs> everything cut down to the very base where the new root I'm mean, not the roots but the new sprouts will come out. I mean I've I've cut trees down before I've got some several of them in my yard and when I cut them down, uh, if I leave them go and don't mess with them, I get the uh, shoots that come off of that stump. That's just my, that's just my experience with the tree in a in a feeling of nature. So would that um, correlate with that? What you're trying to press your point at? Well, I'm all I'm asking. I, I'm asking this for consideration because we've looked at this literally many times. Yeah, but, but we're not very, supposed to take it in on literal. It's supposed to be symbolic at this point. Right. And that's been the that's been the big hang up from what I can see is that we keep throwing that literal aspect into it. Well, as as we've been approaching this, especially from Malachi the last several weeks, we've been approaching it figuratively, symbolically. Yeah. Because, I haven't seen all the new ones, but I'm I'm still in the uh, the foundations about, you know, number 70. Okay. I know the way that, that I was always trying to keep up with, with a lot of the light that elder Jeff was putting out is I would record these in such a way so I could put them on my cell phone and then I would play them through my, the, the uh, stereo in my service rigs. That's what I do. I used to shock people because I, I would get to the point where I could listen to four or five presentations. Oh and God. Then, then when <laughs> I would day, show I, a day I, or at the same time. <laughs> a day. Okay, yeah. A day. I, I can't do it at the same time and I can't do it in the fast method that, that was being told that I needed to do by Parminder and Tess. Yeah. That doesn't work for me. I have to actually uh, review them about three times before I get them real good and planted. Right. I just, I, I, I did that all the way through the Habakkuk studies. Mm. And I had, I had one party that was doing a Tuesday night presentation. And I'd get, you know, several of the Habakkuks and I listened to them on the road and I'd come up to be ready for the study and he would be making a point and I'd go, well, your point is good, but it's kind of countermanded by what is said in such and such. And he'd look at me and go, how do you know this? I said, just listen. <laughs> yeah. And well, my examples have been that you yeah. guys are talking and, and, and then, you know, you would ask a question, Theodore, I, I keep hearing you asking questions and all I hear is crickets. And <laughs> I just kind of, you know, I, I'm sitting in my car uh, driving up and I'm yelling at this, the darn radio you know what, <laughs> what the answer is 
<laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> but anyway, we we have um, our time is almost up here. So what's okay. the what what are we going to wrap this up with, Dwight? Okay, the final comment from Daniel four. Wherefore, O King, let my counsel be acceptable acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins in righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility daniel is giving a, a very specific warning for us today and if we take this symbolically i think he is giving a warning to those that are still within the corporate church that not only does this church look like it's about to fall, but that it does. And that we will have those that will come out that will look to understand these symbolic representations. Yeah. Well, the way that I would look at it is the structure falls. But Ellen White says what she's implying is that's not really the fall of the true church because the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. So we right. will see that even though it, even though the structure doesn't survive, the precious wheat still does. Right. Yeah. And there's several, several points that are made later in some of these quotes that, that we, I've been pulling together. So, yes, our time is now up. So, yes, we are going to be returning to this. And there's some other things that, that I would also like to be, you know, be able to present before you for your consideration. Yeah. I mean, you're going to do the next one on Sabbath morning before the Canadian group study. I'll have, I'll have a study prepared there, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we know that you are long suffering and that you do not seek for any to be lost. But we recognize, Father, that this is our choice. Whether we accept and have faith in the way that you are leading and that you are directing our paths, or whether we choose to accept the arm of flesh, that that is where we need to rely. We ask, Father, for your guidance today. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your watch care. We ask that we may carefully consider these things so that when we return again to meet, we will have come to an understanding of that which you are trying to tell us. Please bless those that have been in this meeting. <clears throat> Please, Father, bless those that will view this meeting later. Direct us and guide us in all things that we are to do so that they are done to your glory and to reveal your character. For this, we thank you, and this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.